So this video is lesson two on the research methods attached to social psychology. As a quick recap of um, the methodological content for social psychology, we're looking at self-report data. So this lesson is going to focus on the design and conducting of questionnaires and interviews, um, thinking about unstructured, semi-structured and structured interviews and the differences between open and closed and rank scaled questions. We're also going to have a look at sampling techniques um, and the use of random stratified volunteer and opportunity sampling. In the last lesson, we had a look at the differences between qualitative and quantitative data and the strengths and weaknesses of those. And you should also have by now recapped on your quantitative data. So calculating central tendency, um, measures of dispersion, tables and bar charts, discrete and continuous data and when we would use a statistical test. And we have also recapped on ethical considerations from the British Psychological Society Code of Ethics. So we're also going to have a quick look at thematic analysis as well in this lesson. So that will be all of the methods associated with social psychology. So we're going to start off by looking at questionnaires. So you need your social psychology booklets. And if you turn to page 73 towards the back of the booklet in the methods section, you can work through the information as we go through the different types of questionnaires that can be used. OK, so you've got some introductory information there on page 73 that you need to have a look through. Um, this gives you an idea of what a questionnaire is. So it outlines how it's a set of written questions that are answered by the respondents and they self-report the data in terms of giving their answers. Um, the written format of a questionnaire means there's very little flexibility about the question. So it's structured in the sense that the questions are pre-written. Remember, structure is about the question as opposed to the answer. So an open question isn't an unstructured question. It's structured because you've written it. The answer is qualitative to an open ended question. Um, in use of social in social psychology, obviously questionnaires have been used for a whole host of different reasons. Um, it allows you to target large and representative samples because you can send out a questionnaire to so many different people of different um, ages, genders, nationalities and so on. And obviously it gathers both quantitative and qualitative data if you use open and closed questions. So one of the things that you do need to do if you're evaluating the use of questionnaires in social psychology is to be able to connect that very clearly to examples where questionnaires have been used to gather data. So at the bottom of page 73, you can see four main studies um, in social psychology where questionnaires have been used to find out um, about social psychology issues. So you've got Adorno, Berger, Reicher and Haslam and Cause. So you can see the information developed there on the screen in front of you. What you need to do is pause the video at this point and make a note in the space on page 73 of the more detailed information on the use of questionnaires by Adorno, Berger, Reicher and Haslam and Cause. Once you've written that down, um, please restart the video. OK, so if we have a look at the top of page um, 74, You've got a link there to right wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation. If you remember, these are the individual differences in personality that can explain differences in prejudice across society. And um, one of the things when you're designing a questionnaire is that you do need to make sure that you can put in lots of different types of questions depending on the aim that you're looking for. So you might have quite straightforward questions that come first. This may even include um, age, gender, occupation and things like that, that give you kind of that background to the representativeness of your sample. And then it may sort of lead into more in-depth questions where you use open questions to find out more information. Um, questions gathering personal data um, should be put at the end. So if you're going to ask um, open questions about how somebody feels, thinks, their personal views and perspectives, then that would be something at the end because that tends to be 
quite heavy going. So you want them to go through the nice, quick, straightforward, probably the closed questions first, and then get to that more sort of in-depth stuff at the end. Um, for ethical and practical reasons, they shouldn't be too long. Um, two sides of A4 is probably the maximum that you want to do. Um, people do get fed up filling in questionnaires. If you sent them a you know, 45 page document, you'd never get any responses. And with a questionnaire, you should always do a pilot study. So that should be implemented um, with a small number of people just to check that people understand your questions. One of the things with questionnaires is you talk, quite often tend to write a question um, thinking that you have um, given sort of straightforward terminology and that they're not leading questions but they do actually need to be checked first of all. And that is also important to make sure you get the kind of answers that you're looking for. So bottom of page 74 onto page 75 talks about the differences between closed and open questions. So starting off with closed questions, um, these are where the answer is closed off. So you may give a question that has yes, no, maybe, um, and it forces the participants or the respondents to pick a particular answer. Other types of closed questions include scaled questions where you might make a statement, say how far do you agree with the statement, and you might be picking an answer. So a Likert scale, um, strongly agree, agree, neither, disagree, strongly disagree, um, or a scaled question, um, you know, on, on a scale of one to 10, how obedient do you think you are? 10 being really obedient, one being not very obedient at all, and you'd pick a number. So they're the other options for closed questions. Um, you've got strengths and weaknesses. Um, closed questions generate quantitative data, um, but weaknesses, you're not giving people an option to give that valid, in-depth, detailed response. <clears throat> if you turn over to page 75, you've got some information about open-ended questions. So open questions, um, allow the participant to give quite a substantial amount of detail. They usually start with, what is your opinion about? How do you feel about? Um, what would you do in the following situation? Um, explain why you gave the answer to the question above, things like that. So it's about getting opinion, detail, depth, qualitative content. Um, again, strengths and weaknesses there. Um, for you to have a look at. So what I would like you to do is go through that information on page 74 and 75 in a bit more detail, highlight the key points, and then can you make a note on a post-it note of one similarity between open and closed questions and one difference between open and closed questions. Once you've done that, restart the video and we'll have a look at the different examples. OK, so the bottom of page 75, you'll see some examples of other types of questions. Um, so first of all, you've got a Likert scale. So this is um, making a determination on how strongly you agree or disagree with a particular statement. So the statement is predetermined, it's structured, and the respondents have got the option, in this case, of five different um, boxes that they can tick to decide how far they agree or disagree with the statement that's given. Um, this was used in cause um, when they did a Likert scale. Um, so it's not open to interpretation in the sense that the researcher doesn't need to decide how much a person agrees or disagrees. However, it is open to interpretation from the um, questionnaire respondent because somebody strongly disagreeing um, may have the same level of emotive feelings as somebody who ticks that they disagree. Um, so it's open to interpretation and subjectivity for on the part of actually physically gathering the data because participants may have their own judgments about what is strongly agreeing or just agreeing. The next um, is a rating scale question. So rate yourself on the following scale, putting a mark in the appropriate place on the line. So you can have a scale question from something like this, 0 to 10, happy to sad. They can mark it with a line. You can also do this with a numerical scale from 0 to 10, um, where they circle a number. Again, one of the issues with this is it is a judgment um, from the individual. So somebody's judgment of a score of 2 
um, for happiness may be the same sort of feelings of happiness that somebody else might give a score of five. So it is again subjective to the respondent's interpretation of the question. You've then got identifying characteristics. So circle the characteristics you think apply to your best friend. So you may circle two or three of these um, as a description of um, somebody else, or you may circle um, characteristics in terms of your own thoughts and feelings. It might be um, your thoughts about a person, a group of people, um, in groups, out groups, prejudice, people you would obey, stuff like that. Um, and then you've got examples of open questions. Just the, they've just dropped to the top of page 76. Um, explain or describe how you feel and so on. So what I would like you to do is come up with some of your own example questions. So you've got the research study in on the screen there. We're going to investigate whether year 12 students obey their teacher. So what I would like you to do Put yourselves in the position of a researcher, you're designing the questionnaire, you want to find out if students in year 12 will obey their teacher. So I want you to design a Likert scale question, a rating scale question, an identification of characteristics question and put down a couple of open questions that you would want students to um, respond to or teachers for that matter um, and come up with those different examples. If you can do this individually, and then what I'd like you to do is to buddy up with somebody else in uh, the group and just see what kinds of questions you all came up with together. So once you've come up with your practice questions on page 76, restart the video and we will have a look at some practice exam style questions. OK, so the questions on page 77 that you can see there. Um, these have been taken from a past exam paper, so this is how they might appear on um, an actual exam. In this case, candidates were asked to come up with their own open question and their own closed question. Now, one of the things to remember about this is you've got to be really, 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 really clear. So an open question always, always start it with something like, explain or describe that way you're making sure that the person can't just give a single word answer right and it's clear to the examiner then that it is an open question for question b state one closed question that could be used in the questionnaire about student opinions of a psychology textbook um, remember a closed question make it explicit that it's closed right so give optional answers always end it with yes no maybe all right they're the easiest ones to do think of a question but put in yes no maybe you must 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 have the closed end to the question you've got to have those fixed answers that's the whole point of a closed question it comes with fixed answers so come up with the question and put the fixed answers in there um, I'd also like you to have a go at the strength and weakness. If you remember when we did um, cognitive research methods and if you've had a look at the revision video, um, you must, for the AO1, um, identify the Graves strength of the questionnaire or the Graves weakness of the questionnaire. So what is it about questionnaires that are good? Um, what is it that is not so good? Right. Um, and then for the AO3, right, you must use a link to how do you know this in psychology? How do you know that this is a strength and how do you know that this is a weakness? So bringing in something like Adorno, Berger, Reich and Haslam or Coors will allow you to develop that point for the AO3. So what is the strength or weakness, AO1? That must include identifying the key feature of the method, the questionnaire, and linking it to a point from Graves immediately, and then pick out the detail or the depth. Um, you can also link it to objectivity and subjectivity and quantqual data if you want to have a go at using those via AO1 as well. All right, so have a go at those questions and restart the video once you're done.
So the other method of gathering self-report data is interviews, which we're going to have a look at now, and they start on page 78 in your booklet. So the difference between interviews and questionnaires is that interviews usually involve a face-to-face -face or at least a verbal situation, so it might be a telephone call, um, and a series of questions that follow. Um, it can involve a complete set of questions, like a questionnaire, so you could read them out verbally. This is a structured interview. Um, and you can use closed questions in an interview. So you can physically ask somebody, um, you know, how far do you agree with this strongly, just agree and so on. So you can still do that. Um, interviews do tend to be a mix. So they tend to be what we call semi-structured. Um, the difference between an interview and a questionnaire, obviously, is that the face-to-face -face or verbal situation allows the opportunity to expand or clarify on the questions. So if you've asked a question the person doesn't understand, don't know what you're talking about, they can say, I don't know what you mean. Can you rephrase that? Can you expand on that? And you can also do that with the participants. So you can ask them to develop their answers and give you more detail. So quite often um, the interviewer goes about finding out the personal data that's required for the study. So if you're looking at prejudice, for example, you might want to know if men are more prejudiced than women. So you would obviously need to ask um, about gender of participants, um, employment status, um, marital status, all these different things that may well be relevant to your research data. If it's not relevant, you wouldn't spend your time during an interview finding out all these different bits and pieces. You'd only find the ones that you want or need to use for your um, particular piece of, piece of um, research. You are most likely to have standardised instructions at the start of interview, so you would read that out or get the participant or respondent to read that themselves. And that covers your ethical issues. So you'd express in there um, what you're aiming to look at, how you're going to keep the details confidential, the fact that the person can withdraw at any point during the interview. <clears throat> you would plan out in advance what we call an interview schedule. So an interview schedule is the process which you're going to go through. It makes sure that your questions, your sort of structured element, the direction that you're going in is fully operationalized. So you know exactly how it's going to link back to your aim or hypothesis. You know exactly what data you're looking for. and You know kind of what direction you're taking your interview into. Um, there are a number of ways of recording data. You can either record it on a tape recorder, video, or you can have somebody with you that writes it down. Um, no matter how you initially gather that data, you would usually then fully transcribe the interview. So that would generally take hours and hours and hours. You write down literally word for word verbatim exactly what was said, all right, including pauses, gaps, um, stutters, uh, the amount of times people go, um, 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 you would include all of that. Um, and that is an incredibly time consuming way of recording the data after the interview has taken place. So in terms of the three different types of interview um, that you're looking at then when you're gathering self-report data through this method, structured interviews have predetermined questions and they can have predetermined answers. So that is a very, very focused, structured set of questions. Quite often this is done um, when people are stopping you on the street, if you've ever been stopped and asked uh, to take part in a survey and ask your opinion about different things, that's quite often a structured interview. Semi-structured interviews, they start with a set of predetermined questions um, and develop that a little bit further. So further questions are asked by the interviewer as a response to whatever it is that the participant has actually said. So there's a mixture of open and closed ended questions and structured and unstructured um, processes within this. You may well have been for a job interview yourself. That tends to be a semi structured interview. So they'll start off with um, very specific questions that relate to the job. And then depending on what response you give, they might ask you to expand a little bit more on some of the things that you've talked about. The last one you tend to have is an unstructured interview. Um, this is incredibly informal. Um, you start off with a particular topic or focus, and it is much more like a conversation. So you might sort of say, oh, hello, you know, what do you think of prejudice? And see where that goes, picking out um, what the person's saying in response and coming up with questions to sort of tease out the depth and the detail. Unstructured interviews require a little bit less planning, but they require 
much, much more skill in terms of the interviewer themselves. So not everybody um, would undertake an unstructured interview unless they're highly trained in interviewing techniques. So some of the key similarities and differences, if you turn over to page 79, um, structured interviews with predetermined questions and unstructured and semi-structured interviews, you've got a little table there on page 79. If you can make a note of the key features, similarities and differences in the boxes from the information you can see on screen, and then once you've copied that down, um, if you can restart the lesson. So going on to page 80, um, you've got a little summary list there, which can act as a checklist when you're carrying out an interview with someone. So things like, have you decided what format it's going to be, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, how are you going to record it, what is the schedule that you're going to follow, um, have you got questions for each area, do you need to request personal data if you do, is it specifically relevant to the study and things like that? So these are the kind of thought processes and steps that a researcher would go through if they're thinking of carrying out an interview a research task. So underneath that on page 80, you've got your strengths and your weaknesses going on to page 81 there. So what I would like you to do as with the other sections in this bit, have a look through the strengths, have a look through the weaknesses, highlight the key features, key points, um, our main um, strengths and weaknesses in there and then summarise those again on a post-it note or a small piece of paper. So begin to chunk down um, some of these notes for revision purposes. So squish it down, one post-it note for strengths, one post-it note for weaknesses. And then you'll notice on page 82 and 83, there's a bit of space there for you to have a go at putting together um, an eight mark essay. Now, Obviously, this isn't big enough for you to do a full eight mark essay. It's a plan. So what I would like you to do is using those strengths and weaknesses, put together an essay plan as to how you would answer the question that is on screen. So assess whether interviews or questionnaires are a more effective research method in social psychology. So you're going to combine both of the research methods that we've looked at. Your AO1 is your understanding of interviews and your understanding of questionnaires. Um, that AO1 must include their effectiveness. Now, don't get thrown by the term effectiveness. This is essentially the good and bad points, the strengths or weaknesses of an interview. So why might an interview be better to research something like prejudice or obedience? Why might a questionnaire be better to research something like prejudice or obedience? And then in reverse, why might an interview be worse than a questionnaire for researching prejudice or obedience? So your AO1, what do you know about that method and its effectiveness? Right. Um, think about the practical elements as well. So if you're conducting an interview with somebody, how likely are they to sit in front of you and go, yeah, I'm totally prejudiced, can't stand um, this particular group of people, right? They're less likely to do that. So think about this in a sort of very practical sense, as well as using graves. Um, remember your AO3 must link to social psychology. So you've got to link it to the very nature of investigating obedience and prejudice. So what is it about researching those very, very socially sensitive topics that mean you may prefer to do a questionnaire over an interview or an interview over a questionnaire? And also build into that AO3 evidence that shows that interview or questionnaire has actually been used in social psychology and it's been used effectively. So that takes you back to your summary on page 73 with Adorno, Berger, Eichmann, Haslam and Cause. So you can draw on some of those as well. So have a go at planning that out. What would you put in your AO1? What would you put in your AO3? You've got two blank spaces there um, to put that plan in place. Once you've had a go at that, it takes about 10, 15 minutes maximum, um, restart the lesson. 
or you can wait until the end um, and then do this at the, in the last 15 minutes after we've gone through some of the issues with self-reported data. OK, so looking on page 84, these are summarised um, from there for you. The social desirability, we've talked about that in um, terms of quant qual data and also the use of questionnaires and interviews. So sometimes the respondent just doesn't give a genuine answer. They lie, all right, and they lie to sort of depict themselves in a more favourable light. Do not muddle social desirability with demand characteristics. They're two very, very different things. Demand characteristics take place when a participant guesses the aim of a study, of a research method, um, particularly lab experiments and things like that. Social desirability is when somebody lies so they look better. And that's the only time you would use the terminology of social desirability. So you answer a question in a way that's seen as desirable by society rather than giving your real opinion. For example, very few people would openly say that they agree with segregation and want to go back to you know systems of apartheid. Um, again, very few people would say actually everybody should be heterosexual and homosexuality is abnormal. Right? It goes against current social norms. It goes against current beliefs. People do not appreciate those kinds of views. They're seen as outdated and therefore it would be seen in a negative light. So people tend not to actually give those honest answers. Um, however, with questionnaires, you can build in what we call lie detect questions. Um, so these are questions where you're asking the same thing in about four or five different ways and you would cross reference the answers to those different types of questions just to see if somebody's trying to be socially desirable. It's very difficult to be socially desirable and to lie consistently. So that tends to be a bit built in there. And if you find somebody with the lie detect questions that where their answers don't correlate, um, you take that out of the sample so as to not skew your data. <clears throat> Although administering a questionnaire is quite straightforward, um, designing the actual questions for a questionnaire can be very, very tricky. Um, usually a researcher is not present when the questionnaire is being completed, so it's got to be the case that questionnaires are straightforward to understand, but not too easy to give away the purpose of the question and not so simplified that they don't actually meet the aim. So they're not actually a proper operationalization of the variables that you actually want to test. You've also got to make sure that they're not misleading or that they're not leading questions. Um, and you've got to make sure that it doesn't push people into a particular answer. You've also got to be very, very careful with the personal data that you gather because it can violate people's right to privacy. Um, in modern terms, there's also sort of the Data Protection Act, which you would need to consider if you're gathering questionnaires. So you should only ever ask personal data about what you actually need. Like I said, if you're doing gender and obedience, you don't need to ask about age. You don't need to ask about social class. You don't need to ask what job somebody has. So one of the things that you also need to be able to do is avoid response bias. So this is one of the things that helps with social desirability. Um, so what you tend to do is have statements in your questionnaire that you then mix up, put them backwards, dot them about, put them in all sorts of different places so that you can check that people are not just giving that socially desirable answer. So reversal statements, for example, um, marriage helps society to function. Society does not help marriage to function. Pets make people happy. Pets do not make people happy. So you're getting people to look at the same concept, um, but answering it in a different way. And this is where um, sort of the lie detector bit comes in, because it's quite difficult to consistently be socially desirable if it's not actually your inherent nature. So reliability with the questionnaire is all about the consistency within um, undertaking that piece of research, does it consistently get the same results when it's retested time and time and time again? And you can check that with a questionnaire and an interview. It's obviously easier with closed 
um, questions. It's easier with structured interviews. Um, unstructured interviews will be very, very difficult to check reliability. Um, and it would be very difficult to, difficult to check reliability of the answers if your questionnaire was fully consistent of open-ended questions because ultimately the data that you gather is very qualitative, it's very holistic, and therefore the results would not necessarily be comparable. Equally, it's important to have validity, and validity, as we know, comes in two different forms. So judging the validity of measures such as questionnaires or interviews, um, you would need to be considering both internal and external validity. So Will the findings of your questionnaire be generalizable to real life? So does your questionnaire really ask questions about real life situations, real life circumstances? To ask somebody, would you electrocute someone with 450 volts if they gave you a wrong answer in a test? Isn't really a, an externally valid question on obedience. To ask someone if a police officer stopped you in the street and asked you to produce ID, would you do it? That's an externally valid question because that's the kind of thing that would happen in real day life. Internal validity, does the questionnaire or interview measure what it intends to measure? So this goes back to having those very precise and clear questions that operationalize your variables. Don't ask someone, how likely are you to do as you told? That's very open. What what does that mean? Do you told by who? Uh, your parents, the teacher, your children, the bloke down the street. You've got to be very, very specific and tie it into the nature of what you're testing in terms of obedience or prejudice. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to have a look at improving reliability and validity in self-report studies. Um, if you have a look at the bottom of page 84 you've got your ways of improving reliability so split half reliability which is um, splitting a survey into two smaller tests so the two halves indicate the same thing um, but they're done in two separate ways so that's things like that um, question reversal and stuff like that and then just at the top of page 85 you can see ways of improving external reliability which is your test retest reliability. So you can give out your survey and you can do it over and over and over um, on different occasions to retest your results. Um, looking at validity, you've got ways of improving validity there. So first of all, you've got face validity. So face validity um, is making a very simple judgment. How does it look? Does it look like it's right? That basic kind of approach. So have we got face validity? The questions kind of ask about prejudice. So yeah, we, we're doing all right there. You've got content validity. So you would ask experts to perhaps look at your questionnaire, um, judge whether the questions are appropriate, judge whether they're relevant, judge whether they could be understood. You've got concurrent validity, which is comparing the, comparing the findings of your um, survey, whether that's an, or you know uh, questionnaire or interview, with results obtained by an existing measure. So for example, comparing, say you've come up with your own questions to see if somebody has an authoritarian personality, you might compare that to um, the results of using Adorno's F scale, for example. Um, and then the last one is predictive validity. So do the results of your survey predict people's behavior into the future? So um, if you have um, tested people, I know you're going to questionnaire to see if they're obedient, and they've all said they're going to be obedient to their teacher in year 12, and then you know you ask their year 12 teachers, are these people obedient? And all the teachers say no, then you have no predictive validity. Um, your questionnaire is obviously open to immense social desirability, and everybody lied. However, if their teachers go, yeah, yeah, they're absolutely gorgeous. I love that class. They're wonderful. They're so well behaved. Then your questionnaire wasn't open to social desirability and it can predict that they will continue to behave in a positive way. So you've got two questions there and play explain two ways to improve the reliability of self-report studies. 
and explain two ways to improve the validity of self-report studies. So I just want you to plan or have a think about these. I know you can't do them on the whiteboard, although the whiteboards are in the back of um, the classroom if you do want to have a go at doing it on those. Um, but you can just do it on a piece of paper, buddy up with a couple of others. Um, how would you put that into an answer? So how would you put improvements to reliability and improvements to validity into an exam style question? So your AO1 for these type of questions is the improvement. So that's identifying um, split half retest when it comes to reliability or two of the ways of improving validity. So face validity, content, concurrent or predictive. So you could pick two of those. Um, you identify how that actually works and then you explain for the AO3 how or why that makes it better. So if you're talking for example about test retest reliability, give your AO1, this will um, you know ensure the reliability, you're retesting the results, you're checking your findings, looking for accuracy etc etc and then AO3, this will improve reliability because it makes sure that you have strong external reliability, right? So um, you can be certain that your results are accurate, right? So you would link it to the nature of how or which aspect of validity or reliability is being improved. So AO1 would be test retest reliability and split half reliability. Link each of those then to how that makes it more reliable. And then for validity, your AO1, face validity, content, concurrent or predictive validity, so two of those, um, and then AO3, how and what type of validity does that improve, internal or external, right? So develop that bit there. Have a go at planning those out, buddy up, work together, and then restart um, the lesson once you've had a go at them. Or like with the plan for um, the eight mark essay, you can wait until you've gone through the whole of the lesson and do these at the end. It's totally up to you. OK, so we're going to have a quick look at the information on page 86 about alternate hypotheses. Much of the content here on page 86 um, relates to making sure that you've sort of recapped on this idea of a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, um, accepting, rejecting the difference between a one-tailed and a two-tailed. Um, it's just really that recap of alternate or alternative and that reminder really that the only reason it's called this in social psychology um, when it comes to surveys is because it's not an experiment. So if you remember in cognitive we talked about it as an experimental hypothesis because it's not an experimental method um, it's just renamed as an alternate hypothesis. So hopefully you're fine with the content that runs through page 86. Um, linking to operationalisation, the IV, the DV, null hypotheses and things like that. If you'd need a quick recap, this is a point in time where you would just have a quick look through that, make sure that you're OK with the differences between um, the alternate hypothesis, null hypothesis, independent variable, dependent variable and how you would operationalise those variables. OK, so the last bit of this lesson is to do with sampling techniques. <clears throat> OK, so um, what we're going to do for sampling techniques fil filters in to your homework for this lesson. Um, so you're going to be given a sampling technique to investigate. You've got some information on page 87 and 88 about sampling techniques and there is some extra stuff uploaded to this lesson assignment so you've got wider reading on that as well. I'm going to give you um, each sampling method and what I would like you to do is starting point is your information in your booklet on page 7, 87 or 88. You're then going to research that a little bit further. You can use textbooks that are in the room. You can go on something like Simply Psychology or Tutor to You. Um, and you can have a look at the information that I'll upload as well. And there's some extra videos on sampling techniques on Teams. I want you to do a little post, only an A4 size one, because I'm going to photocopy it and give it out across the class. So just do a small A4 um, size poster. Um, what is the sampling technique? 
how is that sampling technique done? So how, how does it take place? And if you can, can you find some example studies from psychology that have used that sampling technique? Um, don't worry too much about that, but if you can't find it, I mean, volunteer sampling, there's loads. Um, but random sampling, stratified, and some opportunity sampling, it can be a little bit harder. So if you can't find example studies, don't panic too much about that bit. Um, what you could do instead is put some examples in of how you would use that technique for a particular study. So you could put an example in and say, right, okay, I'm gonna look at prejudice. This is how I do a random sample, that kind of thing. So have a think about that. If you can find some studies, fabulous. If you can't, don't panic about that last little bullet point. But I do want a really clear uh, poster. What is it? So what is that sampling technique? The strengths, the weaknesses, how is it done? How is it undertaken? And examples, if you can find it. So the group allocation, which is going to have to be done <laughs> in a very uh, random um, sampling allocation sort of way. If your first name begins with the letters A, B, C, D or E, you're going to do random sampling. If your first name begins with the letters F, G, H, I, J, you're going to do stratified sampling. If your first name begins with the letters K, L, M, N, O, you're going to do the self-selected volunteer sampling. And if your first name begins with P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y and Z, then you're going to do opportunity sampling. So that's the group allocation. Hopefully I've got somebody in all of those. Um, you can buddy up or you can do your own post. So I don't mind how you do it because obviously with this being a remote lesson, it might be slightly different. Um, and then produce a really clear post. It's, go, it's going to the rest of the group. So you're going to give it out to everybody. I'm going to photocopy it. And then you've got a little pack of information about sampling techniques. So that's for the remainder of this lesson and for your homework. So you'll be expected to do that um, for your homework and going into next lesson. If you've got any questions about that task, can you drop me an email um, or a message on Teams? Might be helpful if you want to take screenshots of um, the information on screen there in front of you breaks down some nice ideas about random stratified volunteer and opportunity sampling and as i said there's loads of videos also on teams some extra information so have a look at this maybe take a screenshot um i do want these posters to be really detailed and i want you to develop some of those advantages and disadvantages as well Okay, so the last little bit here, if we turn to page eight to nine, we're just going to have a quick look at thematic analysis. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long because we're going to do this in the social psychology practical as well. Um, so really, it's just to give you an idea of what a thematic analysis is. Okay, so just to finish off the lesson, you are going to read through the information on page 89 and 90 and 91. So that gives you the background to a thematic analysis. And like I said, don't worry too much about this. We're going to do this as part of our analysis in social practical. Um, but overall, the thematic analysis is looking at the qualitative data. So what you would do is go through open ended um, questions. So the responses to open ended questions or the in-depth transcripts of interviews. Um, and you pick out different themes. So you might find that 10 or 11 um, respondents to a questionnaire have mentioned the same thing. So perhaps you're looking at who would they obey the most in society? And a lot of them start to talk about the police and the army and maybe uniformed services. So you may pick out a common theme that everybody seems to be quite obedient to people in uniforms and things like that. Um, there are some specific phases of a thematic analysis. Um, the thing with the thematic analysis is it starts with the data. So you get all your answers to your open questions or your transcripts of an interview 
and you read through them and you look at them and you go through them all and you make sure that you understand exactly what was said, how it was said, the kind of content and comments. Once you've done that and you've got a general idea, you'll sit down and go, right, OK, one of the codes I'm going to use is uniformed services, because actually loads of people have talked about different people in uniform and how they would obey them. You then go back over the data and you pick out the number of places that this occurs. Right. So it might be somebody giving a couple of sentences about a policeman, a couple of sentences from somebody else about the army and so on. Um, you review them. So do they all kind of match? Is this a real representation of the kinds of ways in which people have talked about uniform services as authority figures? You then define and name the theme. So once you've got all that data together, you've written all these little statements out into sort of one chunk so you can see it all in one go. You might call that obedience to um, uniform. All right. So um, things like that. And you'd chunk all that and then you'd look for the next theme. So you do it again. After you've done all that, you come together and you talk about the common themes and ideas that are coming through people's answers to different questions. And that's basically the principle of a thematic analysis. Um, ultimately, this one of the issues with this is it takes a really, really, really long time if you've got lots and lots and lots of answers. It's a very time consuming um, process. Um, equally, it's subjective. So not everybody sits there and says, oh, yes, I would obey people who are in uniform like the police. Um, they may express things in different ways and sometimes it can take um, a lot of work to pick out and decide whether sentences and phrases fit into particular themes and concepts. So that is quite subjective on the part of the researcher. You know, you're interpreting what somebody might have meant. You're interpreting the emotions, the thoughts and feelings behind a statement, not just the statement that is written down. Um, page 91 has got some new strengths and weaknesses. So it is a good way of turning quant qualitative data into quantitative data. So you can code it, you can categorise it, you can count it. So it might be 90% of participants stated that they would obey a police officer, right? Things like that. So you can come up with statistical um, descriptive data. Weaknesses, you're going back there to your subjectivity. Um, <clears throat> the idea that you, you know, you're making judgments on what other people think and believe, and therefore it's, you know, not particularly scientifically credible. So that should be enough for your overview of um, thematic analysis. Just skim through those three pages, highlight some of the key points, and we will obviously do that in much more detail when we get to the social practical. So that brings you to the end of the recording for the lesson. Um, if you haven't already done the eight marker and the little four markers, you might want to go back and do those now. Um, and you are going to begin your research on um, sampling um, as part of your homework. Um, have a read through and look at the videos that are attached to this assignment first and foremost. And then next lesson's video will be focused on sampling and sampling techniques. Um, to give you a bit of starting point and then you can use that lesson time to put together your A4 um, summary sheet. So a little bit of homework it should take about 15, 20 minutes at the most, but you will have the lesson time in your next lesson to actually work through that. Any questions as usual, drop me an email or pop a message on Teams.